belonging. I have up there Romans chapter 12. We're going to get there. But we're going to take a walk through a story to get there. Because I want you to see what it is to belong to this family. And I'm not talking about First Christian Church, although we are a part of it as well. No, what I want to talk about today is the idea of church membership. And some of you are like, well, I'm a member. Kind of a wasted sermon. No, no, no. There's different levels of membership. There's different levels of belonging. And I want to scratch that itch biblically and organizationally. You know, as we've been talking those last few weeks about who we are and how we do what we do and why we do what we do, we've talked about the, the initial entry training that the, I shared with you guys, and then we've talked about how we use our words to build one another up and not tear one another down. We've talked about hospitality and how we support one another. We've talked about giving to the church in tithes and offerings. Last week we talked about discipleship and how it is that we are to continually grow in His Word, continually seek His face, to continually know Him better. This morning I want to talk about this idea of what it is to be a church member. There are formal and informal memberships in the church. There are Memberships that are automatic, and there are memberships that are invitational. But when it all comes down to the final note, it's about belonging. We belong to you. You belong to us. And that is responding to the connection that's available to each and every one of us. I want to start this morning with the story of my namesake. It's fun to walk through the whole Bible tracing one person's name and see their story all the way through it. And as I was preparing this sermon, believe me guys, I was doing my normal thing. I had five pages of Scriptures on membership and joining and being counted to and all of that like I normally would have done to break down all of the words. And Jesus very gently reached down and went, Stop it. Yes, Lord? <laughs> Mark. Yes, Lord. No, no, no. Mark. Yes, Lord. <sighs> Not you, the one in the Bible. Oh, Mark! Go find Mark. And so I'm actually going to start clear back in Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 37, at the beginning of the church. Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 37. Here's an intimidating phrase. All the believers were in one heart and mind. Wow! Wouldn't that be a church to belong to? Where everybody's on the same page, doing the same thing, moving the same direction. And boy, haven't we made a stained glass window out of that sentence. So much so that we'll come into the foyer of a church, we'll come into the sanctuary of the church, and we'll pretend like everything is okay. Guys, I'm going to be real this morning. Some of you sit in the sections that you do because you don't want to sit next to somebody else. You know, the reality is, we like some people better than we like others. Sometimes we have disagreements with one another. Sometimes those disagreements get loud. Sometimes they get heated. Because at the end of the day, we are all fallen people saved and redeemed by the Jesus that we love. And sometimes we forget that. 
And we don't behave towards one another in the love that we should. I won't ask for a raising of hands, but I'm just going to assume that if you've been in the church for very long at all, you've been hurt by somebody in the church. That's just the reality of church. And so we get to this chapter 4 and verse 32, and all the believers are of one heart and one mind. Yes. Amen. If I were to ask you, are you on board with the church? Yes. Do you love this family? Absolutely. We're on board. At the surface level, it looks like this. We continue though. All the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. You guys do that. It's so beautiful to watch. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there was no needy persons among them. For from, the time, from, from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Wow. You know, I could, as a pastor, in all full honesty, write that same paragraph about this group of people. You guys love each other that way. You provide for one another that way. You care for one another in that way. Uh, but we're not done with that passage. Here's where I was trying to get to. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostle, apostles? The apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. You see, for us to understand the story of Mark, we have to start with the story of Barnabas. Because Barnabas plays a key role in Mark's life. Oh, by the way, if you're really curious about this whole giving thing, uh, chapter 5 is where we start into Ananias and Sapphira, two people that were playing the game and wanted to look like everybody else and lied about it, and there's a pretty harsh judgment that's played out there. But that's not the sermon this morning. Go with me to chapter 9 and verse 19. Chapter 9 of Acts and verse 19. Actually, 17. My apologies. Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Yay! Saul. You may not know his name. If I talk to you about the Apostle Paul, you might know him better. This is the story where Saul sees God, Jesus approaches him, blinds him, sends him to Damascus. Here's the guy that was desecrating the Christian church. He was killing people. He was throwing them into prison. And Jesus said, I think you're going to be a great asset for my kingdom. And flipped him over and made him a Christian instead of someone who was destroying the church. And that's where we're at right here. Saul has just become Paul. Well, here's the opening gambit. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. And all those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem? among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? I mean, you can imagine being a Christian and having this one dude that is absolutely killing everybody in the church, he shows up in your town and starts preaching the gospel? Snark? At you? Looking at him like the RCA dog. You know, what? What is that? 
Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. You know, all the Jews that were looking to get rid of the Christians in Damascus were thinking, <laughs> Saul's on his way. And Saul comes in and he goes, actually, we're wrong, they're right, and here's why. And he convinces the Jews that the Christians have the right idea. After many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close eye on the gate, city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, whoa, okay, so he's traveled from Antioch down to Jerusalem. He tried to join the disciples. <laughs> Can you see that playing out? Here's the guy that was, last time he was in Jerusalem, he stoned Stephen. Don't, don't skip that. From chapter 7, the last time Saul was in Jerusalem, he stoned Stephen. And now he comes back to Jerusalem. He's like, hey, can I get with the rest of you all? <laughs> no. Let me think. No. But they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was really a disciple. But Barnabas. But... Barnabas, the son of encouragement, took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how to Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Grecian Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So, Saul needs an in. How many of you guys showed up at the church because a friend invited you? Barnabas and Saul. Saul's like, I'd, I'd like to go to church, but I don't know anybody and I'm not sure they'll accept me. And Barnabas is like, hey, come with me. And Barnabas brings Saul into the church in Jerusalem. And they take him in and they love on him. And then recognizing that he's in danger, they send him to Tarsus, which, by the way, is his hometown. And as we continue through the rest of chapter 9 and all of chapter 10 and into chapter 11, it shifts back to Peter. And Peter is, this is the whole deal with Peter and Cornelius and the Gentiles coming into the church and the whole uh, getting rid of the food laws and all of that. And so that's an incredible passage, but it's not part of what we're talking about this morning. So join me in chapter 11, verse 19. Saul is in Tarsus. Okay. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. So Barnabas gets to go to Antioch and see that the Gentiles are being brought into the church, just like Peter said. Cornelius and his Gentile folk could show up in the church. And suddenly, the Christianity is not just for Jews, it's for everybody. Yay! Y'all ought to be dancing at this point because there's not that many Jews among us. <laughs> That we get to be Christians as Gentiles. Yay! I love this. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them. Because that's his name. Why do you think they call him Barnabas? Because he's an encourager. Guys, we need good encouragers in the church. Amen? We need people who can be positive. We need people who can speak life into one another's lives. We need people who can say, you're doing a good job. We need encouragers. We need Barnabases. Encourage them to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of the people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. He's like, dude, I hadn't seen you in a while. What's happening? And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. 
So for a whole year, don't miss that, for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. By the way, that's a pejorative, not a happy title. In other words, when they were called Christians in Antioch, it was not a good thing. It's kind of like people talk about Christians today. No, those guys are Christians. It was first in Antioch because Barnabas and Saul were co-pastoring that church for a year. That's cool. These guys are really getting to know each other well. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. By the way, Antioch is north, so some people are like down. Yeah, Jerusalem's on a mountain. Antioch isn't. So you have to come down from Jerusalem to get to Antioch. One of them named Abgus stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This actually happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, each according to his ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. So here they take up this huge collection and they send it back to Jerusalem with Barnabas and Saul. Okay, and then we pick up in chapter 12. This is a Peter story. Why would I tell you a Peter story when I'm talking about Barnabas and Saul? Well, because there's a reason. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, chapter 12, verse 1, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. Whoa! One of the first disciples to take the bite. Stephen was just a deacon. This is James, leader of the church at Jerusalem. A man that had walked with God for three years of his ministry. James and John. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Boy, that'll change the attitude in a church. You ever have somebody that you love in a church pass away? <laughs> Every one of us have. There are people in this room right now. Boy, that'll change the mood in the church. Lose two or three of them. That'll change the attitude in the church. And when they saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to guards by four squads and four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover, so Peter was kept in prison. But the church was earnestly praying to God for him. And the night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison. He had no idea that the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city and it opened for them by itself and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself. Whoa, that just really happened. You ever have one of those things happen in your world where you go, well, that just happened. Oh, that's Peter at this moment. He's standing in the middle of a dark street, three o'clock in the morning going, well, that just happened. Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark. Here's our introduction to Mark, where many people gathered and were praying. Now, a lot of you guys know this story, and you know what's about to happen. Peter's going to knock on the door, and nobody's going to let him in because he couldn't possibly be here. He's in prison. They are praying that he would be released, and he gets released, and they don't believe they got an answer to their prayer. But that's another sermon. My point to this is, 
Verse 12 tells us that the church was meeting in the house of this woman who had followed Jesus, who had been a follower of Jesus, whose son is a guy by the name of John Mark. Okay? So this is where we get introduced to John Mark. Skip with me to chapter 13. Oh, no, I want to back up. Yeah, go to chapter 13 and back up one verse. The final verse of, chap of Acts chapter 12, verse 25. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem. So this whole time that Barnabas and Saul were in Jerusalem is the time where James is killed and Peter is imprisoned and released. So they've come down with this gift. All of this has gone on, and now they're going back. When they finish their mission, they return from Jerusalem back to Antioch, taking with them John, also called Mark. So now they've got this young kid that's going with them. They've got this young man who's going to go with them on their adventures. He's going to see what it's like to be a minister. And in the church in Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas and Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, who was brought up with the Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they, sent their, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. This was what we would call the first missionary journey of Paul. Okay, so if you've ever studied that, here's the opening edict of that, okay? The two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia, and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John Mark was with them as their helper. John goes with them. Mark goes with them, okay? And they traveled through the whole island till they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the sorcerer, for that's what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimus and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind, and for a time you will be unable to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul saw what had happened. He believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Persia in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. The Bible doesn't say why. But something happened between the brothers. Something went on. You know, most Bible scholars believe that John was young enough, and this was his first time away, Boy just got homesick. But there could have been something more. We don't know. The Bible doesn't say. All we know is as we trace through Acts, Paul and Barnabas are going off on the mission trail and John's like, hey, can I go? And they're like, get in, kid. Let's go have some fun. Let's go do kingdom stuff. And after a couple of island hops, John's like, I want to go home. And so he returns to Jerusalem. As we go through the remainder of chapter 13, you see the rest of this first missionary journey. And then when you get to chapter 15, you get the council at Jerusalem, which is the whole question. Okay, now we've got all these Gentiles coming into the church. Do they need to be good Jews before they become good Christians? Do they have to be circumcised? Do they have to follow the festivals? Do they have to eat the kosher diet? Do they, have to, do they have to be good Jews to be Christians because they're not? They're Gentiles. And so the council at Jerusalem here in chapter 15 is where they discuss this. What's important to know as you read through that is when you get down to like verse 2, 
Well, let's just go ahead and start verse chapter 15. We won't do all of it, just kind of get you the introduction. Some men came down from Judea to Antioch who were teaching the brothers, unless you're circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. How do you think Paul and Barnabas responded to this? Now, guys, I want you to recognize something. Judea, that's Jerusalem and southern area. These are Christians. These are not Jews. These are people coming out of the church at Jerusalem down to the church at Antioch and saying, okay, all of you Gentiles need to become good Jews before you can be Christians. Um, chapter 2, or chapter 15, verse 2, I, I, the Bible understates so much. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. And you think you're the only one that's ever seen a church fight. Here you got a group of church believers that are saying, hey, we need to go this way. And we got another group of church believers over here going, oh, no, we don't. Guys, don't miss the fact that this whole thing started off with all of the believers were of one heart and mind. Uh-huh, here's the real church. We've got division, we've got debate, we've got argumentation, we've got, I don't think you're right. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. And the church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. And this news made all the brothers very glad. And when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then they get into this whole big thing. Peter sides in. Paul sides in. Barnabas sides in. And the whole point of the end of this is that they decide that Gentiles don't need to become good Jews. We can just become good Christians. Uh, by the way, keep your finger here because we're going to come right back. But here's a really interesting side note in Galatians chapter 2. Something that I want you to understand that while we look at Paul as this incredibly profound Bible teacher, he was a pain in the butt. Just let me put it the way it is. He was not an easy man to get along with. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, raised under Gamaliel. He understood his own titles. He understood his own bullet points. He'd read his own CV and resume. And he was fairly confident that he was right. He's confident that he was right enough to stone Stephen, and he's confident enough to tell Herod where to get off. I mean... When he's, when he's a Jew, he is a straight, in-your-face, lion-type. I want you to know, brothers. No, no, wrong one. That was 111. Start in Galatians 2. Fourteen years later, I went up to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and set before them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. But I did this privately to those who seemed to be leaders for fear that I was running or had run my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. <laughs> and it brought them into sharp debate. <clears throat> Here he's telling you what he said. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might remain with you. You see, sometimes when your pastor gets in there and starts stomping on your toes, it's because we need to. Sometimes the truth isn't what we want to hear. As for those who seem to be important, you realize that every time he's talking about people that seem to be important, he's talking about the disciples. He's talking about Paul. or He's talking about Peter and James and John. He's talking about the guys that we've read about all through the Gospels. And these guys are supposedly important. Whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not judge by external appearance. Those men added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the Gospel to the Gentiles, just as Peter had been to the Jews. For God, who was at work in the ministry of Peter as an apostle to the Jews, was also at work in my ministry as an apostle to the Gentiles. 
James, Peter, and John, those reputed to be pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the Jews. All they asked is that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, you're a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? You who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. If while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners, does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not! If I rebuild what I destroyed, I prove that I'm a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Can you imagine how the council at Jerusalem in Acts 15 really played out. Guys, there was a lot of strife. There was a lot of upset people. This group thought this way and that group thought that way. That's how sometimes people get hurt by the church. It's not that this group is trying to hurt people and it's not that that group is trying to hurt people. It's that both people are trying to serve God and trying to figure this out the best way they know how. And sometimes our humanity gets in the way of our righteousness. As a pastor, I would apologize to every single one of you that have been hurt in the church. I'm sorry that happened. But I'm also going to tell you, as long as we have people in the church, feathers are going to get ruffled. That's just part of being the family. That's just part. How many of you guys get along with everybody you're kin to? Of course not. You got people in your family you'd rather not see at the get together. We're family. And we have to learn to live with one another just as a normal family would. Back to Acts chapter 15. Picking up in verse 36. After we get through all of this with the Antioch or the Jerusalem Council, sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, Let's go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Hey, you know that whole first missionary trip? That was a blast. We started all those churches, we saw all these things happen. Yeah. Let's go, let's do it again. Get in the car, let's go. <clears throat> Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. You know, Mark that had gone with them on the first type and got halfway through and quit and came home. Uh, Paul did not think it wise to take him. Boy, he's just going to get homesick and go home again. I'm not taking him. Can't afford a passage to put him on a boat home again. I'm not doing it because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas, who brought Saul into the church, the friend that invited Paul to Jerusalem, said, let me introduce you. These two get into such a scrape over Mark that they separate. been in that church. Maybe you have too.
Barnabas took Mark, sailed for Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and left. Commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord, he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. By the way, you can read through the entire rest of the book of Acts and you will never find Paul and Barnabas together again. And if that were, if Acts were the only book we had, we'd be in trouble because that's a pretty ugly picture. Although I will say on the plus side, Sometimes the Christian church gets too wound up in its friendships. And sometimes God needs to say, look, you're a fantastic minister and you're a fantastic minister. Stop working together. I need you over in this field and you over in this field. And so whatever the cause, the reality was that you had twice the ministry going on because Paul goes on his second journey with Silas and those are some fantastic stories that take up several chapters in Acts. And Barnabas and Mark go off and do their ministry, their direction, and do their great thing. Guys, that's real church. But that's not the end of the story. You see, I would direct your attention to Colossians chapter 4 and verse 10. In Colossians chapter 4 and verse 10, a, a book that Paul is writing to the church at Colossae, in his closing comments, he says, My fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. Wait a minute, what? Yeah, Paul and Mark are together in prison when he's writing the letter to Colossae. Mark is one of the people that's hanging out with Paul, loving on him, taking care of him while he's in prison. Uh, look what he says about him in parentheses. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. <laughs> Here's the dude that at the end of chapter 15 caused the break between Barnabas and Saul, and yet as we get to the end of Saul writing, Paul's writings, he's going, hey, if Mark comes to your church, welcome him. This dude is an incredible minister. He's, he's here with me. I'm in prison, and he's here with me. He's taking care of me. He's my brother. I love him. Uh, if you go back to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 through 11, the end of the letter that Paul is writing to Timothy, this young pastor that he's teaching how to be a better pastor, he says to Timothy, Do your best to come to me quickly, for Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. Hey, Titus or Timothy, I need you to come back. I need you to come. Come. I'm, I'm here alone and things are bad. And I'll oh, get Mark. I'd love to have that brother here with me. Bring him in. I need me some Mark. Or, or maybe we go to the letter to Philemon. Verses 23 and 24, as he closes out that letter, he writes, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greeting, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. Fellow workers! You see, guys, I got one more and then I'm going to go off. You know that Peter, the dude in chapter 15 also, you know, you all remember Peter crucified upside down, you know, like leading the church. Okay, Peter. He writes two letters too. We've got them first and second Peter in the Bible. And if you look at first Peter chapter five, Peter says, with the help of Silas, <laughs> so he's running with Paul's old running mate. With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly. <laughs> what? Yeah, first Peter. 
Peter and Silas are writing together. You see, these guys are swapping partners all through their ministries. With the help of Silas, who I regard as a faithful brother, I've written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, as does my son, Mark. Peter just doesn't look at Mark as one of those guys the Barnabas brought in. He looks at him like a son. This is the church, friends. This is what church looks like. We may have squabbles. We may have spats. We may have disagreements. But at the end of the day, we are all working together for the kingdom of God and for the glory of the salvation of everybody that will be called and come to Him. These guys didn't quit being mad. They didn't stomp off and start their own church. They didn't swap churches because I don't like such and such. They figured it out. And while that story isn't in Acts, that story shows up in every one of their letters because they made it work. By the way, if it was not for the healing church. Friends, don't miss this. If it were not for the healing church, we would need Matthew, Luke, and John. Because this Mark is the one who writes the second Gospel because of what he learned at Peter's feet what he learned listening to Mary, what he learned listening to the disciples, what he learned growing up in his house in Jerusalem. This Mark is the one who writes the second Gospel. So now we get Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Not just three, but four. You see, what I'm trying to get to you here is that within a church, there are going to be hurts. Sometimes we have expectations of one another that are unrealistic, unspoken, unclear. But there are healings because we're family. We have been family. We will be family. We're always family. And I'm not talking about First Christian Church. I'm talking about the church universal under every banner, every group of people around the world and throughout history who have ever claimed the name of Jesus Christ. That's the church. And we are a family. Every single one of us. Now, we may have some disagreements. If we didn't, we wouldn't have 82 Christian denominations. But at the end of the day, I am quite sure nobody's going to be checking membership cards at the gate. Oh, you were at that church. You can't come in. You actually believe that? Okay. Guys, very briefly. The state requires us to be an organization. So we have officers and we have members. So we keep a list of church membership because the state says to be an organization, you have to have officers, you have to have members. So everybody that has placed their membership with the church that gets to vote in our annual congregational meeting, it's because the state requires it. The Bible doesn't. That's a state requirement. The state requires that we have leaders So we just call our leaders our officers, our deacons and our elders. That's a formal membership. But I want to tell you about the informal membership. And there's actually two kinds of informal membership. One type of informal membership is the fact that if you claim Jesus Christ, you're a part of the church. If you disown the church, you've disowned His body, Christ. Can't say that any more straightforward. 
He said, follow me, be a part of who I am. His body is the church. If you're a Christian, you're going to be a part of the church. You are a part of the church. How engaged are you as a part of that church? You can't be separate from the family. You need to plug in somewhere. And so that's an automatic belonging. If you've claimed Christ, you're part of the church. But there's an invitation that comes along with that. We'd really like you to engage. We'd like you to say, I want to place membership with you. Not so I can vote at the annual congregational meeting, but because I want to throw in my lot with you. I always love it when I was teaching school and and I've actually had a few people here at the church do it that have walked over to me and said, will you adopt me? Yeah! I will. And when somebody comes to this church and they say, "I I want to be a member, what they're really saying is, will you adopt me? I've seen some stuff in this family I want to be a part of. I want to be in this. Can I be a part of this? Yeah. Absolutely. We'd love to have you. Because belonging to the church is all about responding to the connection that we have with Christ and with one another. We're told to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. That's what the church is. We love God. We love each other. That's how we belong. That's how we connect. I don't want to miss the marks. I don't want to see some young man get caught up in a squabble between two elders and wind up leaving the church forever. We've seen it happen. I don't want to see some young lady run out of the church because she didn't put the thing back in the kitchen where it was supposed to be. I've seen it happen. You see, we're family. But being a member of the church comes with benefits. I mean, you should be sitting there this morning going, you haven't painted a really pretty picture of the church. Why would I want to be a part of that? (laughs) Well, I'll tell you, accountability is number one. You need to grow up and you need brothers and sisters to your left and right going, that was dumb. That's just accountability. I need it too, y'all. Don't don't ever think that my position makes me above question. You ever have a question about what I'm doing? You ask it. Because I still need to grow up too. Second of all is inclusion. It's nice being part of the family. It's nice to say, hey, that's my church. That's where I go. Those are my people. Yeah, that person's my brother. That person's my sister. It's great to be included in that. And it gives us, thirdly, a sense of belonging. I may not get along with uncle such and such, but I know, push come to shove, I can call him up and sleep on his couch. He's going to be there for me. And that's the church. We grow together. We work together. We love together. We're family and we belong to one another. And with that comes the support of the family. And that's the fourth thing. The benefit of the church and membership is that we gain that support. You guys have already blessed me and Mickey as we informed you of the tragedy in our family that we're going to have to respond to, you guys have already blessed our socks off. If you need anything, call. If there's anything we can do, here, take this. Let me know if I can buy this. Let me see if we can get that. Do you guys need any? And you don't do it for us because we're the pastors. You do it for us because we're part of this family. Just like we do it for you when you're going through it. That's a membership benefit beyond value. And finally, there's a benefit of commitment. You know, somebody on the train says something stupid, I don't care, he doesn't live in my house. The person that I'm on the train with says something stupid, and I'm like, hmm, I don't know that that was necessary. You see, I care about this person because we're committed to one another. 
And if you say something, you know, if I'm out on the street, I'm walking down Spring Street in the middle of one of the parties or festivals or parades or whatever's going on down there, and somebody comes up and says something ultimate, vicious, or ugly to me, I'm like, ow, that hurt. I go home, done. My brother or my sister comes up and says, rah, 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 and I have to go, ooh, what if they're right? I, I need to think about that. I, I may need to grow up here a little bit. I may need to... Uh. Now, I would pray that they would come to me with grace and speak the truth in love, but I recognize that people's people, and sometimes they don't. And then I get to be accountable to them, and then after I've licked my wounds and fixed my junk, I can come back to them and go, by the way, that was so helpful. I appreciate you pointing that out. Let me speak to you about grace. Because the way you said it was wrong. That commitment makes for a long-term relationship. Guys, with just a few verses. Romans chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and Ephesians 4. No, I'm not reading all of those, but, but those are where they're at. I'm just going to let the Bible speak for itself. Why do I want to be a member? What is it to be a member? Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and Ephesians 4. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and to prove what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather... Think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. Serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope. Patient in affliction. Faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless. Don't curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it's written, it's mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. 1 Corinthians 12, just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free, and we are all given of one Spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. And if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the ear should say, I'm not an eye, so I don't belong to the body. It would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? 
If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as He wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. 2 Corinthians 6, We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened wide our hearts to you. We're not withholding our affection from you, but you're withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak to you as my children. Open wide your hearts also. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What, what agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. And I will be father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Ephesians chapter 4. So Christ gave himself, I'm sorry, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head, that is Christ. From Him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They're darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they're full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in Him according, in accordance with what the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry and don't let the devil get a foothold. Anyone who's stealing must steal no longer must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. And don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you're sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander among, along with every form of malice be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave 
you. You know, I've had a lot of people come to me and say, how is it that we quench the Holy Spirit? Dividing the church. You know, that whole don't grieve the Holy Spirit is smack dab in the middle of grow up to be Christ-like. Be unified in all things. Guys, I see the church as a seminary, a place to learn. I see the church as a hospital, a place to heal. If you've ever been in a hospital, you know that some rooms stink more than others because their need to heal is greater. That doesn't make them less human. It makes them more broken. And we as the church ought to rush to that room to give them the support that they need. We should love and hold one another. We belong because we belong. My conclusion this morning is simple. Let us grow up together. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for He who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Hebrews chapter 10. The reality is this. I can't be a Christian by myself. And neither can you. We can't do this alone. We, the church, need you. You, the Christian, need us. Mark became the person in the early church that he became because he was a part of the family. And through the storms and through the strife, they stuck together. They figured it out. They became holy. And they all grew up. Barnabas, Silas, Paul, Mark, they all grew in their love of Christ and in their love of one another. He became who He was in the early church because He was a member of the church. Heavenly Father, as I close this morning, I ask that You would Help us see beyond the formal membership of what the state requires as an organization. I pray, Lord God, that You would help us to see ourselves as what You intended us to be. We use the word family because we understand how family works. And we grow together and we sometimes grow apart and then we grow back together. And Lord, some of us have very, very broken families. And we've never seen what a healthy family can look like. I pray, Lord God, that this church, that every church would demonstrate what a healthy family looks like. And Lord, we will sometimes hurt one another, but we will also be there to heal one another. Let us grow together. Let us recognize that You have called us together as broken people to unite us around a single fire in the Holy Spirit. May we find our center in You. And let the ways of our sinfulness fall away as we are transformed in mind, conformed in spirit to the unity that is Christ. Lord, I pray that this talk on membership wouldn't come across as just a drive to get more names and numbers on the roster. But that, Lord, Your true heart would be felt. My true heart would be felt. This church's true heart would be felt. That we long to be a family 
a single body where every part is respected for the part that it plays. Every piece works as it should. And that we don't try to make everybody conform to everybody else because we don't need one big eye. We need eyes and ears and noses and fingers and legs and toes and hair and skin and organs. We need it all. You've created us a diverse people that functions through the blood that You shed on the cross and the Spirit that lives within us making us Your temple. Sew us together. Knit us as in our mother's womb together as a people that we who were not a people would become a people for the kingdom's sake and for Your glory. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. I would speak over you a benediction this morning that comes from the letter to the Philemon. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all His holy people and for your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Thank you, family. Look left. Look right. This is family. This is belonging. This is home. Come home. Amen.